Welcome to Gritability, a podcast about the power of perseverance, overcoming seemingly insurmountable odds to attain the life of your dreams. My name is Adam Clausen. I am your host. My co-host next to me is Ro Clausen, the beautiful and amazing and extremely talented better half of this podcast. And we're going to share with you um, some of the stories, some of the experiences that allowed us to attain the life of our dreams. And I'm really excited today to talk a little bit more about our personal experience and ultimately us getting to where we are today. Last time we were in here, Ro. Yes. <laughs> we talked a little bit about your background, how you developed that grid ability. And we've had some interesting conversations on this that I'd really like to share with the rest of our audience today about a little bit more about your background personally, because uh, we talked about my experiences, but you've had your own set of experiences um, throughout the course of our relationship, the things that we did together. Um, just for those of you who didn't know, we together were serving a 213 year sentence um, no chance of parole, no chance of early release, yet together we overcame incredible odds and are now living that life of our dreams. So we're eager to share some of those experiences with you. And I want to take it back to uh, last episode when we were talking about a little bit about your background. We didn't really get to go into it. Where do you want me to start? Mm. Well, I, I would say one of the, uh, one of those, cause it wasn't like a, a singular experience. It was something that you dealt with for an extended period of time. And this is something that's very personal. Uh, I hope you're willing to, you know, open up and share that experience. Of course. Yeah. Now I know what you're talking about my mom. Yes. Okay. Christmas day. I can't remember how many years ago, but it has to be like 15 years ago. Christmas day, big Italian family, everybody's in the house. And my parents say, we have an announcement. We want everybody to just gather around the table and we want to tell you guys something. It was bizarre. Nothing like this had ever happened before. And they tell us that my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer two weeks before. And what was odd about it was that Everybody, aunts, uncles, cousins, all of my siblings, except for my one of my younger sisters and myself, lined up as if they were having this funeral procession and almost mm. saying goodbye. And it was bizarre. And my sister Marissa and I looked at each other and we're like, oh, no, we're not having this. Like she was diagnosed with breast cancer, which is terrible, but she's not dead. So we're like, everybody get the tequila, not the best way to deal with your problems, but we're like, we're going to celebrate that she's alive and we'll deal with this another day. And not the denial part of it, but I think a lot of that speaks to the grid ability where you get to choose how you're going to deal with and get through a situation. If you act like you're at a funeral, when you were just given a bad diagnosis and it's terrible, then you're kind of going to put yourself in a grave early. So from there, my mom asked that she went to, um, into remission. She got chemo. She got, you know, the breast removal, reconstruction, all of that. She asked her doctor a couple months later, how, what are my odds of this coming back? And bedside matter is clearly a thing of the past because, or at least with this doctor, because she said, well, I don't know if you really want me to tell you. You don't want me to tell you, right? And my mom said, well, now I do. And she said, well, 70, 80%. So my mom lived every single day mm. saying phrases like, this is going to take my life when the cancer comes back. And it did. And she had a good stretch, maybe seven, 10 years, something like that. But when it came back, it came back with a vengeance. And at that point I was living with her and I decided that I wanted to take care of her. I wanted to help her through this. And a lot of me being able to do that was the fact that we had the relationship that we had at that point, you and I. 
I had my other siblings were all in relationships, married with children, and they had different responsibilities at that point. And so I was able to use that time again, perspective, right? Because it sucks. Cancer sucks, period. Taking care of somebody with cancer sucks, especially somebody that's that close to you. But I was able to say, like, I'm going to use this time to bond with my mom. And if you and I weren't in the relationship that we were, if you were here, if we had children, I wouldn't have been able to have that time with her. So yes, it was hard, but I cherish that every moment of it. I mean, to the day that she died. What you just said was, I mean, and incredibly, I can't even imagine what it would have been like to live with that experience every single day, having a loved one uh, that you know is struggling with something that it ultimately it did take her life, but that has the potential to take her life. That's a difficult space to live in. And I'll relate that to, to our relationship, our challenges, as difficult as they were, so many times when we had the highs and lows, I was not on, uh, I was not in fear of dying. Like that we had a vision for our life together um, that kept us focused on where we were going, but that was not a, a real concern at the time. Dying was not a concern. So this is a very different situation. Your perspective and what you're saying about how you chose to face that to be proactive, um, that speaks to when we talk about grit ability, like to me, that's what it's all about. So tell us about what was that like on a day to day basis? How did you like what were some of the the ways that, you know, you wake up, you're like, man, I'm here. I'm in the house with a loved one dealing, you know, with this situation. Um, how do you face that every single day? It comes back to that phrase don't think, just do. If I sat long enough to think about my mom's dying and I'm watching it, my God, like how do you live every day, right? So I didn't think like that. I just thought, okay, today's another day. How am I gonna get through this? You know, I have to go to work. I'm gonna come home. I used to come home for my lunch break because I worked about seven miles from the house. So I would come home, I would spend some time with her, go back to work, go to the gym, come back, take care of her. And that was it. It was just kind of that routine. Um, and just treasure that time together. Not thinking about this is, you know, a countdown, like she's going to die any minute like that. It was more, what are we going to do today? How are we going to fill our day? What are we going to do to have fun? Mm, wow. And how long did this go on for? How long was your mother sick? The second time when it came back, um, when it was much more severe, I want to say five years, maybe. I don't five recall years. exactly. Yeah. But it wasn't until the very end, because she worked until the last two weeks of her life. Talk about credibility, right? Mm. She, would, she was a um, dental assistant, and she would literally be on oxygen and tell patients, oh, I just have a little asthma. She's dying. Wow. So it was really the last, maybe the last like six months, but the last two, three months that were really, really bad. So how much of that, what do you, what are those things that, that grit ability that clearly your mom had, how much of that do you think you inherited? All of it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, I would say too, um, it's been very intentional. There's, especially with us, with our relationship, going through all of the challenges that we went through, I would say you know, early on, maybe that even helped to prepare you for that situation. I know you said previously um, on the podcast here where we talked about, well, how do you deal, like someone had asked you, you know, how do you deal with the separation? You guys are apart all this time, like no intimacy, like no sex. How do you deal with that? And your response was? I work out <laughs> a lot. I work out a lot. So having those strategies, constructive outlets, I would say are, are a key component, right? Like you have to know how to deal with that stress to say that that period was not a stressful time, right? Um, so when it came later on, 
after that, unfortunately, after your mother had passed away, um, you had that, that experience with her. I would say, from my perspective, that that made you much, much stronger and better equipped that when we faced additional challenges in the future, as we talked about, when it came up for, say, clemency uh, and ultimately then in the final uh, stage, right before I was released, incredibly stressful, challenging time. Would you say that you were then better equipped to deal with that because of your experience, your ongoing experience with your mother? Of course. And it's almost a morbid analogy, but you can use it in any area of your life. It's like a muscle. You're always going to doubt yourself until you get to a point where you do it, you get through it and you're like, oh, okay. All right. I did that. So when the next hard thing comes up, you're strong enough to, it's like building that muscle. You're strong enough to get through that. And it compounds just like you said about your marathon. I got the trophy. They can't take it away. What's next? Mm. Speaking of those physical challenges, you know, in the same way that you dealt with that, that lack of intimacy, you said work out, right? Like that was a big part of it. Um, I want to jump ahead just a little bit to that period. Um, another, hmm, let's say it was a very physically challenging time, right? It was a, it was a, uh, one of those periods in your life where, you know, major changes going on going on, not just with your bodies, with your hormones. You know what I'm talking about here? I think I do. <laughs> I do. Okay. You're pregnant. Yes. We find out you're pregnant, right? We're working out hard. Like we've been you know, so looking forward to spending this time together. And it's funny because when I got out, what was the first question everybody asked? When are you going to make a baby? <laughs> this is like day two. They're like, you're not pregnant yet? Talk about pressure, right? So, you know, we're enjoying ourselves. We're actually spending this time together every day. We're getting a chance to work out. We're in incredible physical shape. You were just like remarkable, right? I spent all these years, and, and this is probably going to sound strange to, to viewers, right? But from the inside, you know, obviously I couldn't wait for us to be together, to be intimate, right? That component. But man, I was also really looking forward to us working out together every day. This was something, this was a way that we connected for years and to be able to get out there and to do these partner workouts. And if people haven't seen our videos, you would say there's a level of intimacy there too, right? Where a lot of our workouts, especially those ones early on where we're partner workouts, you know, where we're carrying each other, and uh, <laughs> a lot of physicality to them, right? If you haven't seen her in action, she is amazing, right? When I talk about grit, physical strength that has been cultivated by, you know, not just going through the motions. It's really, in order to build that level of physical toughness, you have to be mentally tough. And I know that for you, you know, we talked about that connection, but that was a process for you as well. So in dealing with your mother, you develop the emotional toughness in dealing or cultivating that physical toughness. How did, because you were competing up to a point uh, and, and that ended prior to our relationship, but man, like you continued all those years to physically get it. What did that look like? And how did that contribute that physical component contribute to you building that mental and emotional toughness? Okay. So let's start here. Competing in fitness. I actually don't think I was fit. I think I just looked really fit, if that makes sense. And I didn't realize that until after the fact, and I started working out and eating in a different way, not necessarily just for aesthetics, but also for health. So let's rewind all the way back to when I found out how babies were born, I was always petrified of that. I knew that I wanted a child and I knew I wanted to try to have a child naturally, but it scared the bejesus out of me, to be honest. So I was in really good shape because you and I always said, if and when you were released, 
you know, we were in our 40s at the time. We needed to, we needed to stay as healthy as we possibly could in order to, number one, live long enough to enjoy our life together, and also, number two, try to fulfill that dream of having a family. So I was 42 when I was pregnant, and side note, my mother was 42 when she had my youngest sister, and I always said, I will never be that old when I have a baby <laughs> because she was always like the old mom in the classroom joke was on me. That's when I had my first, not my sixth, not that we're having sex by the way, but I knew I needed to stay healthy through this. And I was considered as awful as this term is a geriatric pregnancy over 35. You're considered an old mom. And my doctor was wonderful because she gave me the choice. She's like, listen, you're in great shape. I can send you over to the advanced maternal care, which I guess is a little bit nicer way to say. Advanced maternal care. Correct. So you're like a grandma slash mom, you know, okay. grandma's age, but you're a mom. So she said, but I don't think you need to go over there, but the choice is completely up to you. And I said, well, if you're comfortable, I'm comfortable. That's fine. I'd like to stay with you. And I knew I needed to stay healthy and I wanted to stay healthy because I'm all about breaking the stigmas, right? And I wanted to break this stigma of you're too old to have a baby and to have a baby naturally and to stay healthy during pregnancy. So I ate extremely healthy. I really didn't have many or any cravings. Sugar was the most disgusting thing on the planet to me when I was pregnant. I think I was just lucky. That's the way my hormones were. But I worked out every single day. I did CrossFit four times a week up until two weeks before I gave birth. And the only reason I stopped was because the gym that I loved, my favorite gym on this planet, was 40 minutes away. And I didn't want to be driving by myself 40 minutes, taking an hour long class, and then 40 minutes back and being that far from the hospital. So I worked out at our little complex gym until the day before I gave birth. And the only reason I didn't work out the day I gave birth was because I didn't know I was in labor and I was waiting to get through my doctor's appointment. We'll get to that in a minute. But yeah. there was a point where we, you and I both, we had to stop posting on social media about it because we started getting all these crazy comments back. Like you're killing your baby. What about the one with the uh, yeah. hands over your head? Sure. So there's this old wives tale that says that when you're pregnant, you can't lift your hands above your head or the baby will get strangled in the umbilical cord. And it's an old wives' tale, right? Because if you think about it, you wouldn't even be able to blow dry your hair. And I'm assuming if that really was a thing, that probably would have been the first thing my doctor told me, like, make sure you keep your hands below your shoulders. I don't know. But anyway, this was said with genuine concern. And this man saw that I had posted a picture. I was doing clean and press at the gym. So, mm -hmm. you know, you clean the weight up. And I was doing a decent amount of weight. Hold on. You were doing cleans around your belly? Yeah. yeah, you just yeah kinda... I, I just want to point this out because I was there. I saw this in person, you know, just in awe of you every single day throughout that pregnancy. Because as your body was changing, like you were fully committed, determined to stay healthy. Yes. And here's the thing. This isn't me bragging or showing off. Your body is an incredible machine and it will adapt. And that's not to say that I did things that were dangerous. If something hurt, I didn't do it. My doctor told me you can do anything your body will allow you to do until you can't. Listen to your body. I stopped working my abs at 16 weeks because I couldn't lay on my back anymore. I couldn't breathe. So I would stop and I would just do other things. I couldn't run after 20 weeks because it hurt. There was a baby like jiggling in there. As long as you listen to your body it's and your doctor, it's going to tell you what you can and can't do. And so will your doctor. So back to the story about lifting my arms above my head. I had this man because I had posted this picture of clean and press. I was so proud of myself and it was kind of adorable. And he sits next to me. We're at an event and he grabs my hand and he said, listen, can I just tell you something? Please don't take this the wrong way. I said, of course. And so he said, you know, my mommy told me, my mommy, my mom told me this when she was pregnant. She said, or I'm sorry, when my wife was pregnant, she said not to lift your hands above your head, baby, you know, strangled the umbilical cord, blah, 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 blah. So I said, oh, okay, all right, I'll stop. And then we just stopped posting on social media because of, you know, that was genuine concern, but there was also a lot of backlash. Well, there was, and there was a term that term was fit birth. Yeah, we learned that later. Which I still can't get past. I think it's a TikTok term. It's a TikTok term. Yeah. Okay. So 
just in case any of you haven't heard of the term fit birth, now follow me here. This means that while a woman is pregnant, she continues to work out and take very good care of herself. Okay, any anybody else like miss the point here? Fit birth, like isn't that what everyone's supposed to do? Okay, so generally what we learned is, and this is something across all aspects of, of our life, of our relationship, when you're doing things, when you're doing those really difficult things that develop gritability, right? That define who you are as, as a gritty person, um, you're going to make other people uncomfortable. And those people often want to tell you what you should or should not be doing. And it's their own insecurities speaking out. So for us, it was about having the courage to, okay, we hear what people are saying. We're not going to change our lifestyle. We're, <laughs> we're not going to respond to that in a responsible manner, right? Like we, we took your doctor's advice. You know, we consulted professionals. And more than anything, you really listened to your body. Sure. And as someone who has spent a lot of time in the gym, very in tune as all, you know, long lifelong athletes are, you know, as you said, as things were changing, you constantly checked in. And there were times when you said, you know what, this, I need to change things today. This isn't working for me. And we, we made those adaptations. So I think the second part of that is yes, having the courage to maintain your conviction. We knew that staying healthy was a priority. It was something that we were fully committed to. And despite that negative feedback, that backlash, we kept going. And so I want to step ahead to the result of that. The result of that was my doctor, after CJ was born, looking at me and saying, I think I need to go back to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I, you mean the baby is the result? Uh, the baby, wow. <laughs> Listen, this Coach Clausen, <laughs> Coach Clausen, our, our household CEO, um, all, almost 18 months of him, is absolutely amazing. And I credit you because you were the one that carried him. So you passed on all of that directly to him. But even before we get to that, right, I want, I want to talk about um, the actual birth, mm -hmm. right? Because you did all of this, you, you know, stayed committed to our routine, daily routine, healthy, ate well, um, fit birth that results in we're in the delivery room, right? You said that that was something that you were so afraid of, you know, giving birth naturally to a child. Here you are in the delivery room. You, you want to talk us through that? Because I was there, right? And I was just, I was the coach. I was there for support. You were the one that, man, talk about the results of all those years of um, that physical challenge, building that physical toughness, but also the mental toughness, the emotional toughness. Man, that made for, I, I was just in awe you know, being, being a part of that experience with you. So a couple months before one of my girlfriends told me, and she has two or three kids. Why don't you take one of those birthing classes just so you can learn how to breathe, you know, and, and get through that pain. And I said to her, I thought about it. And then I was like, but I've been breathing through pain for so many years with my workouts. I know how to, I don't think anyone could teach me any differently. I know how to do it. And I think it'll just make me more nervous. So I didn't. How far back do you want me to go into the story of that day? Mm, uh, not too far back. I'm, I'm saying like when things pick up, right? Because okay. oh. there's a whole part about dry cleaning. <laughs> well, why don't we start there? Why don't we okay. start to, um, I'll start it off. Because okay. I got the phone call from you that day. And at the time, I'm in my office. Um, sitting behind a desk and you FaceTime me, right? So I'm looking at you, but I'm going, wait a minute. She's, she's in the car, right? So I recognize where you are. You're, you're in the car in a parking lot somewhere. And, you know, I said, how'd your appointment go? And you say, oh, good. Although they say I'm in early labor. 
And for me, like there was just a disconnect. I'm looking at you in the car, FaceTime, you know, like, like normal, like every other day. And you're telling me you're an early labor. I'm like, time out. <laughs> What's wrong with this picture? What are you doing in the car? Why am I still in my office? And there's that brief moment of panic. Like I'm ready to just snatch my keys and literally run out the door because I'm on the other side of town. But you were so calm. And that's why I, it wasn't fully registering. I was a little confused. I, at that point, didn't feel much of anything. So I had my regular routine appointment that day. And as I was walking into the appointment, I felt like a little bit of cramps in my stomach, but nothing really. I was like, oh, I didn't drink enough water today. It's July in Las Vegas. I mean, it's hot. So the nurse says to me when she came in to check me, she said, oh, are you feeling those contractions? And I said, no. So she's like, let's just check you. She comes out and she's like, uh, I'm going to get the doctor. You're in labor. So I was like, um, okay. And I heard all of these stories, right? Because if, if I'm going through something, I'm going to prepare and I'm going to over prepare. So for nine months, I was the crazy person that watched all of those God awful birth stories on YouTube. So I'm expecting to be doubled over in pain, crying, you know, that happens. And so it wasn't happening. So I, Oh, and one of the videos or a few of the videos, I think people would go to the hospital prematurely and they would get sent home. And so I didn't feel anything because the labor would just kind of stall. And I said to the nurse, I'm like, she goes, you're in labor. I said, but this can stop. Right. And she's like, she looks at me like I am a lunatic. And she goes, I mean, it can, but it also can. And so the doctor came in and he said, listen, he's like, you're in labor, go home. Cause all they're going to do if I send you next door to the hospital is have you walk laps for a couple hours. You're going to be bored, go home, relax. Once it starts getting bad, then come back in and we'll admit you and you know, we'll, you'll progress. So I still didn't feel anything. And I called you and you're like, uh, still on the phone with me. I think I'm going to come home. And I was like, we well, don't have to. And you're like, no, I think it's a good idea. So we go home and now I'm texting my sisters and my sister-in-law all on a group chat. And I'm like, you guys, they like say I'm in labor, but I don't really feel anything. I think it's like a hoax. Right. And they were like, Roseanne, you need to go to the hospital now. You are in such good shape that this is going to go fast. And if you don't go to the hospital, you're going to have that baby in the toilet. And then I realized, I've texted another friend who was a nurse who said almost the exact same thing, a little bit nicer because she's a friend, not a sister. And that's when we got serious. So you're like, all right, let's go. We get in the car and this is the dry cleaning part. I'm like, why don't you stop and pick up your dry cleaning? I was going to do it after the doctor anyway, because I was just so either in denial or just not feeling anything. Like, I don't want to go to the hospital and be sent home. I'm glad we stopped for the dry cleaning because we ended up being at the hospital a couple of days. Yeah. And I had clean shirts in the back. There so, you go. You know. See, I was looking out. But he, he, here's, here's the part that, and this is probably what caused some of that disconnect as well. Just a few hours earlier, the day before, we're out in the neighborhood. We do a lot of workouts around our neighborhood. And the neighbors must think we're crazy, right? We're that crazy fit couple. Meanwhile, she's pregnant out to here. <laughs> with a rucksack that's weighted doing squats on the curb. That's because <laughs> we were trying to force a July 4th baby and I did anything and everything in my power to get that baby out on July 4th. And it worked out absolutely perfect. It because did. It did. His, his birthday, 7-7-21. Oh, that's a good place to go back to. Exactly. So let's go back into the actual delivery here. So we're in the hospital. Um, you check in. And in my defense, when I checked in, you could tell the nurse was on my side, like, oh, today's Tuesday. Why don't you just wait until Saturday? That's my birthday. So clearly she thought nothing was happening too. Admittedly. And, and who knows how many, you know, pregnant women she deals with exactly. every single day. So she would know what that looks like. Exactly. But we end up staying there, being admitted. Um, you and I end up in the back, not exactly how I had pictured it. I guess for me, who hasn't watched all of these videos, thankfully, right? I, one of us had to be removed from that. Um, so I, 
I guess in my mind, I'm picturing, you know, what you see on TV, the, the, the delivery room, there's all these people in there and, and I'm there and that's not at all the experience that we had. I think at the end it was like that, but they put me in almost an in-between waiting room where my doctor came in. She had called the nurse who was the one that said I was in labor. She said, I called her. She told me what's going on. She said, unfortunately, this is crazy. I learned this that day. If you're not 39 weeks pregnant, they can't give you anything to increase your labor, to make it, to induce it, to go faster. Mm. And I was, I think 36 weeks and seven, six days, something like that. I was just before 37 weeks. So she said, you're going to have to sit here and I'll come back in about an hour and check you. And if you haven't progressed, I'm going to send you home. But if you have pro progressed, then we can admit you. I think it took five, 10 minutes. Cause remember back to my sisters, they're like, this is going to go fast for you. So we were just kind of hanging out. Oh no, you were doing a video conference with me in labor. Put me on the video for a second. <laughs> True story. True story. That's True story. fine. I was, I was fine with I was, it. I was doing a live stream. You were. And uh, this, this was work-based, mind you. So. Um, it was cute, though. I mean, everyone get, wished us well, and it, they waved. And It was. Yeah. Everybody was, was happy to be a part of it at that time. So, yeah, um, yeah this is just another part of that experience. And again, it spoke to, you were doing great at that point. People are like, you guys are really in the hospital? She's really in labor right yeah. now? Yeah. But then I think maybe five, 10 minutes later, I was like, get the nurse. And you went out in the hallway to look for the nurse and she wasn't answering. And I was like, get the nurse. <laughs> You're like, she needs you in here. <laughs> Hurry up. And they came in and they checked me and then they brought me back to the other room. And I have to say this, I'm crazy and I can handle pain, but I don't like pain and I'm not that crazy. I did opt to get an epidural. Okay. Yeah. So it was, it was a, um, I don't know how you say it, but it wasn't like an all the way natural. Some people, they say natural, they mean no pain medication. Not that crazy. Here, here, here's what I do want to, and, and we've talked about this plenty of times. Yeah. There's a difference between building that, that physical strength, toughness, mental toughness, right? And unnecessary suffering. Yes. That's a very good point. We're at a point now where I, I would say we are wise enough not to put ourselves in those situations where we suffer unnecessarily. And some, and just to say this, some people want that experience and they don't believe in the drugs and they don't want the baby to be exposed to mm -hmm. that. Do you boo? I admire the hell out of you. But for me, that wasn't the route that I chose to take. I, I, exactly. And, and it's the same thing with, you know, there are things I have personally subjected myself to and have paid for as a result where yeah. I'm like, Looking back now, mm, I didn't need to do things that were going to leave me scarred yeah. as a result. So it's about having the strength to get through the situation, not unnecessary suffering. So sometimes you need to, to mediate that a bit, right? So going through that experience, you and I and the doula slash, um, what's the other term? She was just the baby nurse. The baby nurse, right? So the doctors leave us in there. She's like, see, ya, I'm going to get lunch. Uh, I think she went to deliver like six other babies. Oh, that's right. That's right. Six other babies, right? We were, we were number seven. She's like, yeah, I'll be back in a little while. I'm going to go to another hospital. I'm like, you're leaving? We're in labor here. You can't just leave. She's like, no, you guys are in good hands. I, I can see you got this. Okay. I'm, I'm pretty confident in my abilities of, to do most things. Leaving me in the room with one nurse and my wife, who is in the middle of giving birth, mm, not so confident, right? However, we fell into a rhythm, a routine that for me became comfortable. I was like, this is very similar to our workouts. And the doula, the nurse that we had was incredible. This woman was amazing. What an incredible coach who was coaching you. And I think this is a point of distinction that, that I want to point to all those years of working out, you being so in tune with your body, when she was telling you how to contract, how to breathe and to make adjustments, you could do that. Yeah. I don't think most people could do that. Yeah. It felt like I was being coached by a coach in the gym. She was wonderful. Yeah. Amazing. So for me, it was that experience. I, I remember being in the moment going, wow, this has got to be an incredibly, this is a physically challenging 
very painful situation that she is well prepared for because of everything she's done up to this this moment. And just like your sister said, I would say that experience went pretty quick. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. For a first child, they said that it did. Which reminds me. Yes. At this point, it's about 10 p.m. <laughs> and we realize it's July 6th. And Adam looks at the clock and he's like, wait a minute. We could have a 7 7 21 baby. Like, that's perfect for Vegas. Slow down. And I'm like, uh, who's doing this? I asked her if, if she could just wait. Can just you, just slow down a little bit. I mean, you have this thing so well under control. Can you please slow this birth down just, just for a little while longer? Just hold on so that our son can be born on 7-7. She looked at me like, are you crazy? Do you want to change places here? So, you know, I eased back. I'm like, that was probably a very unreasonable request. <laughs> It, now looking back, it was adorable. Okay. It's adorable after the fact. However, I mean, it worked out that way. Our son was born on 7-7, 7 7 true Vegas style. Um, and he is an amazing, amazing little human being who is now developing a personality all his own. And I would say that is so much the result. I mean, we saw even as a baby, the physical strength that he had. Um, and even now, like his personality as that develops, like he is, he's, he'll fall down three times, four times, five times trying to do something. And he gets right back up and does it like, and I feel like that was something the two of us working so many years you know, overcoming so many challenges that that has become so deeply ingrained in us uh, down to a molecular level, right? Like that was something that we were able to pass on. Um, and we get to continue to pass that on to them daily, you know, with, with life lessons as, as we continue to face life and all of the challenges, um, talk about things coming full circle. And really it's one thing to see it in yourself, right? But to now see it, in our son, what we've been able to pass on and share with him. And undoubtedly, you know, your community, um, strong prison wives and families, I feel like they are very much a family of my own as well. Talk about incredibly supportive. Like these are people who uh, just have fully invested. You've so inspired them, you know, that these are people who continue to, uh, to be interested not only in our story, in our lives, but continue to be inspired by our experience. Uh, I feel so fortunate to be a part of this relationship with someone so amazing, with so much grit ability, uh, the lessons that I learned from you. Uh, to me, that's, that's the ideal, right? That a relationship should be that complementary of one another and you know relationships are something that are very important to us uh, but first and foremost it's always about making sure that our relationship is strong is solid and i hope people can see now that they've had a little bit more of a chance to see your grit ability to hear a little bit more of the background those things that have the experiences that we've shared that have not only individually made us stronger, uh, more physically uh, built our physical strength, our mental toughness, our emotional resilience throughout all these years together uh, have prepared us for an incredible life that we are now leading and all of those things that we envision for ourselves, for our family going forward. And I'm really excited for us to continue to share, share a little bit more of our past, to have some guests coming on here who can share their experiences and give us the opportunity to find out what has made them so successful in their relationships. We thank you all for tuning in to Gritability and hearing our story of the power of perseverance, overcoming seemingly insurmountable odds. I'm Adam Clausen. And I'm Ro Clausen. And we will see you back here on the next episode.